Welcome, everyone. We're back at the uh, Flink Forward con user conference uh, sponsored by the Data Artisans folks. This is the first US-based Flink user conference. And we are on the ground at the Kabuki Hotel in San Francisco. Um, we have a special guest, um, Stefan Yuan, who is one of the founders of Data Artisans and the creators, one of the creators of Flink. He is CTO, and he is in a position to shed some unique light on the direction of the company and the product. Welcome, Stefan. Yeah, so um, you were asking about how how can stream processing or how can Flink and data artisans help companies that are enterprises that want to adopt these kind of technologies actually do that, despite the fact that we've, we've been seeing, if we look at what the big internet companies that first adopted these technologies, what they had to do, they had to go through all this big process of, of productionizing these things by integrating them with, with so many other systems, making sure everything fits together, everything kind of works as one piece, what can we do there? So I think there are a few interesting, um, interesting points to that. Let, let's maybe start with, with stream processing in general. So stream processing by itself has actually the potential to simplify many of these setups and infrastructures per se. There's, um, there's, there's multiple dimensions to that. First of all, the ability to just more naturally fit what you're doing to what is, what is actually happening. Let me qualify that a little bit. All these companies that are dealing with big data are dealing with data that is typically continuously produced from sensors, from user devices, from server logs, from, from, from all, this, all these things, right? Um, which is quite naturally a stream. And processing this with, um, with systems that give you the abstraction of a stream is, is a much more natural fit. So you eliminate bunches of the pipeline that do, for example, try to do periodic ingestion and then grooming into individual finite data sets and then periodic processing of it. You can, you can for example, get rid of a lot of these things. You can you kind of get a paradigm that unifies the processing of real-time data and also historic data. So this, this by itself is an interesting development that I think many have recognized and that's why they're excited about stream processing because it helps reduce a lot of that complexity. So that is that is one side to it. The other, the other side to it is that um, there was al always kind of an, an interplay between between the, the the processing on the data, and then you want to do something with these insights, right? You, you don't process the data just for the fun of processing it, right? Usually the outcome influences something, and sometimes it's just a report, but sometimes it's something that immediately affects how certain services react. For example, how they you know how they apply their um, decisions in classifying transactions as frauds, or how to send out alerts, how to you know trigger trigger certain actions. The interesting thing is, and um, we're going to see actually a little more of that later at this conference also, is that that in the stream processing paradigm, there's a very natural way for these like online live applications and the analytical applications to merge together, again reducing a bunch of this complexity. An another thing that is happening that I think is is very very powerful and helping a lot right now in bringing these um, kind of technologies to a broader ecosystem is is actually how the whole deployment stack um, is growing. So it's so we see actually a more and more um, more and more users converging onto onto yeah onto resource management infrastructures. Yarn was a Yarn was an interesting first step to make it really easier once you've productionized that part to productionize more systems. But even beyond that, like the uptake of Mesos, the uptake of container engines like Kubernetes and so on, the ability to just prepare more functionality bundled together out of the box. You just pack into a container what you need to and, and um, put it in a repository and then various people can bring up these services without having to go through all the, all, all the setup and integration work again. You can kind of way better template integration with, with systems, with this kind of technology. So those, those seem to be helping a lot for much broader adoption of these kind of technologies. Both okay. stream processing as an easier paradigm, fewer moving parts, um, and, and developments into deployment technologies. So let me see if I can um, repeat back just the, the summary version, which is mm -hmm. stream processing is more natural to how the data is generated and so we want to match the processing to how it originates exactly. and flows. At the same time, if we do more of that, 
that becomes a, a workload or an application pattern that then becomes more familiar to more people who have not, who didn't grow up in a continuous processing environment. Um, but also, it has the third capability of reducing the latency between originating or ingesting the data and getting an a, a analysis that informs the decision, whether by a person or, or a machine. Yeah. Would, would that be a... Yeah, I think you can even go one step further. It's not just about, about reducing the latency from the analysis to the decision. In many cases, you can actually see that the part that does the analysis and the decision just merge and become one thing, which makes it much fewer moving parts, less integration work, less... Yeah, let's, let's just okay. ma maintenance and complexity. And this would be like, for example, how uh, application databases are taking on the capabilities of analytic databases to some extent, or how um, stream processors can have uh, machine learning, whether they're they're doing online learning or calling a, a model that's been, uh, that they're going to score in real time, or even a pre-scored model. Is, is that another example of where we put... You, you can think of, that, of those as examples, yeah. Um, and a nice way to think about it is that if you look at what a lot of the what a lot of the analytical applications do versus, let's say, just just online services that you know match offers and trades, look at um, or, or want to generate alerts. A lot of those have a, a lot of those kind of are in some sense different ways of just reacting to events, right? If you if you're receiving some some real time data and you just you just want to process these interact with some form of knowledge that you accumulated over the past or some form of knowledge that you accumulated from some other inputs and then react to that. That kind of paradigm, which is in the core of stream processing frameworks like Flink, actually is, 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 is so generic that it covers many of these use cases, both building direct, directly applications, as, as we've actually seen, we have seen Flink users that build that directly built a social network on Flink, where the, the events that they receive are, you know, a user being created, a user joining a group, and so on. And it also covers the analytics of just saying, you know, I have a stream of sensor data, and on certain outliers, I want to raise alerts. It, it's, it's so similar once you start thinking about both of them as just handling streams of events in, in this flexible fashion that it helps to just bring together many things. Um, so, that would that sounds like it would play into the notion of microservices, where the service is responsible for its own state, and they communicate with each other asynchronously. So you have a, a cooperating uh, collection of components. Now, yes, there are a lot of people who grew up with databases, you know, out here, sharing the state among modules of applications. What might drive the growth of this new pattern, the microservices, for you know, considering that there's millions of people who just know how to use databases to build apps? Yeah. So the the interesting part that I think drives this this new adoption is that it it's just such a natural fit for the microservice world. So how do you how do you deploy microservices with with state? Right. You can. You can have a central database with which you work, and every time you create a new service, you have to make sure that it fits with the capacities and capabilities of the database. You have to make sure that the group that runs this database is okay with the additional load. That, or you can go to the different model where actually each microservice comes up with its own database, but that, that time, every time you deploy one, and that may be a new service, or it may just be you know experimenting with a different variation of the service, A-B testing. You have to bring up a completely new thing. In this, in this interesting world of stream processing, stateful stream processing as done by Flink, state is embedded directly in the processing application. So you actually don't worry about this thing separately. You just deploy that one thing, and it brings, it brings both together, tightly integrated, and and these and it's a natural fit, right? The working set of your application goes with the application. If you deploy it, if you scale it, if you bring it down, these things go away. What the what the central part in this thing is, it, it's nothing more than, if you wish, a a backup store, um, where you would take these snapshots of microservices and store them in order to, you know, recover them from catastrophic failures. In order to just have an historic version to look into, if you if you figured out later, you know, something happened and was this introduced in the last week, let me look at what it looked like the week before, or to, to just migrate it to a different, different cluster. So um, we're going to have to, to um, 
cut, cut things short in a moment, but I wanted to ask you one last question. If, like, microservices um, as a sweet spot and, and sort of near real-time decisions are, are also a sweet spot for, for Kafka, what might we expect to see in terms of a roadmap that helps make those, either that generalizes those use cases or that opens up new use cases? Um, yes, so what, what we're immediately working on in, in Flink right now is, is definitely extending, extending the support for, in this area for the ability to keep much larger state in these applications. So state that really goes into the multiple, multiple terabytes per service. Um, functionality that allows you to, to manage this even easier to evolve this, you know, if, if the application starts actually owning the state and it's, it's not in a centralized database anymore, you, you start needing a little bit of tooling around this state, similar as the tooling you need in databases, schema evolution and all of that. So things that actually make that part easier. Um, handling larger state and then we're actually looking into what are the, what are the APIs that, that users actually want in this area. So Flink has, I think, pretty stellar stream processing APIs. And if you've seen in the last release, we've actually started adding more low-level APIs, one could even think, APIs in which you don't think as streams, as distributed collections and windows, but you just think about the very basic ingredients, events, state, time, and snapshots. Uh, more um, so control. More, more control and more flexibility by just taking directly the basic building blocks rather than more high-level abstractions. Um, I think you can expect more evolution on that layer, definitely okay. in the near future. All right, Stefan, we have to leave it at that and hopefully to pick up a conversation uh, not too long in the future. Um, we are at the Flink Forward Conference in the Kabuki Hotel in San Francisco, and we will be back with uh, more just after a few moments. Yeah.